Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this. This is the Charter Day and it's the breast session. Uh, you're very welcome. We've put together a uh, what I think is a really exciting program for this morning. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to start uh, with uh, Professor Martin O'Sullivan, who's going to talk about the challenges for today's breast surgeon. We're then going to go into a very interesting debate, and one that I think will have passion on both sides. One, it's about who should be on the general surgery roster. And speaking against being on the roster is Louise Kelly. Speaking in favour of being on the roster for general surgery call is Jerry O'Donoghue. And then we're going to finish with a session on DF breast reconstruction and where its position lies in the modern practice of breast surgery. And Jamie Martin-Smith, my colleague in Bowman, is going to uh, speak to that. So I'm going to kick off the session and introduce uh, Martin O'Sullivan. Martin, as you know, uh, over the last number of years has chaired uh, the leads group at the NCCP and has provided a significant leadership and important leadership for breast surgeons. Some of the achievements have been in terms of our national referral form uh, in coordinating that via HealthLink and the vast majority of our referrals now come electronically. I think that is the way forward. But Martin has led uh, on many aspects for breast surgeons and our radiologists so he's had an important role over the last five years, and we really welcome his thoughts on the challenges for today's breast surgeons. Martin, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnie. Can you hear me okay? We can indeed, yeah. So I'm just waiting for my screen to load up now. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we got them, Martin, go ahead. Okay, so Arnie, uh, and uh, th thank you for the invite to speak here uh, this morning. Um, I think the, the breast service is probably the flagship service in the country, certainly one of the flagship services. But when you're given a topic like this, there's certainly a danger that it could turn into a, a good old fashioned rant, uh, looking at when you start thinking about the challenges that we're facing. And I think this single key word, resources, or perhaps lack of them, really summarizes a lot of the challenges that we're, we're, we're facing today. I don't think you'll find a single surgeon in the country that says, that says they're adequately resourced for everything that they do, but there are certainly some serious problems around the place. Now, when we're looking at challenges, uh, I think there's some unique challenges. There are some general challenges that affect all doctors. And then I spend a lot of time, obviously, on the breast specific challenges. I think the unique challenges we've had to deal with in recent times are the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, certainly, I think the breast service can uh, look back with a considerable amount of pride as to how we handled this. Uh, some patients needed to be outsourced to private hospitals at the time. But any patient, I think, that was diagnosed with breast cancer during this COVID-19 pandemic still got a very high standard of care that they'd usually get. This wasn't necessarily easy for us delivering the care. But uh, I think the big problem that has arisen, of course, is the backlog of cases uh, remaining to be seen, but I think all the urgent cases did tend to get seen. Obviously, breast check closed down for a while, and I think we're seeing uh, some of the consequences of that now with, uh, you know, more advanced disease at presentation, more patients going for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and so on. Uh, to my mind, the cyber attack actually in some ways posed a bigger problem. Certainly the safety issues didn't get the media publicity that I, that I thought they deserved. And I'm very conscious when I'm talking about that, that our radiotherapy colleagues, for example, or those who are very heavily laboratory based had far more problems than we had. But hopefully the cybersecurity issues will have been dealt with and we won't have such issues into the future. I do think the war in Ukraine is going to have an effect on us. Um, there are talks that there might be up to 200,000 Ukrainian refugees coming into the country. And obviously with the men staying behind to fight this war, there's going to be a disproportionate number of women. And that's certainly going to impact the breast clinics. Indeed, we're seeing patients already uh, who have unfortunately been diagnosed with breast cancer. There are a few patients, for example, that have commenced neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the Ukraine. Um, they don't know what their receptor status is. They don't know what their breast cancer, uh, really what type and so on, what type of chemotherapy they, they've had. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of these problems. 
And, uh, you know, these women are extremely unfortunate that they, they, they're going through a desperate time. But certainly it is also going to impact the breast clinics going forward. Now, you know, I could spend all day talking about general issues affecting the Irish healthcare system. Uh, obviously, the country has borrowed very heavily uh, to get through the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think we're in a fairly poor economic state overall. Uh, the interest rates on the bond markets have been quite low, but eventually we're going to have to start paying back that money. And it does strike me that any spare money that might be floating around in the health system will probably be uh, given to the uh, children's hospital. Uh, Something called Slogia Care uh, is coming down the tracks. We don't really know what this is going to be in the end. I, I, I suspect we'll end up something that's called Slogia Care. Um, but the more I think about this, and, and I did miss the debate in the RCSI a few months ago, but the more I think about this, I'm, I'm struggling to see how this is actually going to improve the Irish healthcare system, despite the fact that it's obviously very well intentioned. We're certainly having difficulty recruiting doctors. There are over 800 vacant consultant posts in Ireland at the moment, and that's a very bad state of affairs. And indeed, when we appoint uh, new consultants, we, we treat them traditionally very poorly. Uh, they're obviously very poorly paid compared to their counterparts that were recruited before 2012. Um, but even for surgeons, they're not given adequate theatre resources, clinic facilities, so on. And this is a very sharp contrast to the uh, people that are appointed into the private sector, of course. Uh, the failure to reform the medical legal system in this country is, is, is a disgrace. I mean, this is going on for decades now, if not years, or, sorry, decades rather than years. And there was talks about the no-fault New Zealand model being introduced uh, when I was a medical student, and absolutely nothing has happened. And it's a very challenging environment for us to work in. And of course, the, the ironic thing is, I, I think if they did reform the medical legal situation, I think they would get uh, rid of a lot of their waiting lists. Open disclosure is particularly prevalent following the cervical check issue, and it's particularly important for the breast screening service. But indeed, it's, it's an important issue for all of us, as indeed is the general difficult regulatory environment with the Medical Council. I think anybody who's been in front of the Medical Council will tell you it's a very stressful event. And yet, when you're, when you're in front of the Medical Council and you have an inquiry going on, you're expected to work as normal and see huge volumes of patients. Uh, I think we need to change this so that there is a fairness to both patients, but also to the doctor. It's certainly flabbergasting to me that there's no unique patient ID in 2022 uh, in Ireland, and we're, we're light years away from electronic patient records, I would say. As, as I've said already, there are many other issues, but these are a few issues that did occur to me. I think one other very big issue is the whole issue of social media. I think everybody has an opinion on social media nowadays, and sometimes he or she who speaks the loudest um, gets the most publicity, not he or she who's speaking the truth or has the most logical opinion. I think from our point of view, it's very important that we behave ethically and responsibly on social media. But certainly patients are coming in now with lists of questions uh, the whole time. And sometimes you see three, A, four, uh, you know, sheets of paper with questions on them. And you certainly get a heart sink moment when, uh, when you see that these are typewritten. So these consultations we're doing on a daily basis, they're taking more and more time, um, uh, you know, compared to about 10 years ago. Now, there are some breast specific challenges and I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk on, on those. I, I do think we have a little bit of an identity problem uh, currently. We've always trained through the general surgery uh, umbrella, and I think this will continue to be the case for the foreseeable future. Um, however, a lot of breast surgeons do general surgery, some do endocrine surgery, some, certainly the more uh, younger people coming out nowadays, tend to be trained in oncoplastic surgery. And of course, it's very good for us that three of the five chairs of surgery in this country are, are, are breast surgeons. Um, so there are a few general breast issues that I'll, I'll just touch on. I think you're going to be hearing far more about the on-call situation from Louise Kelly and Jerry O'Donoghue. Uh, it's my understanding that about one third of the breast surgeons in the country have come off the general surgery on-call rota. About one third wish to come off the rota and about one third wish to remain on the rota. Uh, my own personal view is I think all parties need to be accommodated here. Those who wish to stay on call need to be uh, facilitated. And equally well, those who wish to come off call need to be able to come off in a fairly structured manner. 
Um, we're seeing some changes in terms of localization techniques. We're moving on a little bit from wires. We've certainly embraced the localizer and cork. I, I know other colleagues around the country have used the MagSeed. And indeed, we're, we're trying the Savvy uh, Scout technology in, 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 uh, later on this month. I think none of these techniques is perfect at the moment, but hopefully things will improve as time goes on. We're very heavily dependent on our breast radiologists, and we're very fortunate to have excellent breast radiologists in Ireland. However, there is a major recruitment problem in breast radiology currently. This is not just a national problem, it's also a worldwide problem. And it'll be very interesting to see how the artificial intelligence scenario plays out, particularly given the increasing problems we're, 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 we're having. Um, we have a new disease. Uh, the World Health Organization recognized the breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma in 2016. Certainly wasn't there when I was a student. Um, and uh, thankfully, it's a fairly uncommon disease, but we don't know a whole lot about it. Um, I think in response to the, to the whole cervical check issue, a letter was sent to patients saying that a high risk implant or a low risk implant, and undoubtedly, this could have been handled as somewhat better. I think the letter actually upset an awful lot of patients uh, when they came through, but it's certainly an, in, an interesting entity to have a new disease that we have to look after. I think the old chestnut of radiation and reconstruction remains to be uh, resolved. Um, there are various techniques to try and improve on this, but it's still a problem for us uh, when we're doing breast reconstructions. And just a very brief word on DF flap reconstructions. I, I know Jamie will be speaking about this in a while. I think it's rapidly becoming or perhaps has become already the gold standard of breast reconstruction. Um, however, there is a geographical postcode lottery as to where you are in the country and to whether you can easily get a DF flap or not. And this is an issue that does need to be addressed going forward. Now, I think the, the major issue that's facing us as breast surgeons is the volume of patients coming into the clinic since the designated uh, eight cancer centres were developed around 2008, 2009. And of course, there's a satellite centre up in Letterkenny. There are three main sources. Uh, one are the symptomatic new patients. The second source is the family history group. And then there are the return patients coming into the clinics. Now, I think some of what's going on with the return clinics is absolutely crazy. I mean, there are patients travelling large distances to see a medical oncology team, to see a radiation oncology team, and to see a surgical team. And they're often seeing the most junior members of the team. They may be traveling separately again to have their annual mammogram. And uh, this, I, I would suggest to you that this is of very limited benefit to these patients. Um, I, I know it's, uh, that the NCCP has planned to look at this in due course, but uh, I really feel that if patients are on endocrine therapy, they do need to see a medical oncologist to see are they complying with their endocrine therapy. And if they're not, why aren't they complying with their endocrine therapy? We've looked at this uh, ourselves in Cork in the past, and up to 30% of patients aren't taking their endocrine therapy as planned. Looking briefly at family history, it's somewhat ha haphazard across the country with a lot of ad hoc screening and variable standards emerging. The HICWA HTE report in 2013 said there was questionable benefit, in fact, no real benefit to uh, uh, doing this in moderate risk patients. However, it did conclude that some kind of structured program was better than the ad hoc screening that currently exists. I do think it's important to focus on those who would genuinely benefit from having extra screening and to avoid screening those that wouldn't benefit. Now, in fact, before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we initiated a family history project with the NCCP and had some meetings before the COVID-19 pandemic. And those of you involved who, who are on listening to this will remember that we had agreed we would have a virtual assessment clinic, which was somewhat of a novel idea. And this was, as I say, before COVID-19. The whole family history project got understandably shelved uh, because of the pandemic, but it's been resurrected again in recent times. In fact, in the past two weeks, three subgroups have been formed and the membership has been finalized. There's going to be a primary care, care referral subgroup, an assessment clinic subgroup, and a surveillance subgroup. And one of the purposes of the surveillance subgroup is to ensure there's a qu proper quality assurance program with all mammography double red, similar to what exists on breast check. The aim of course is to standardize care across the country. Um, there are gonna be lots of challenges with this. Um, one challenge that is, is obvious is MRI uh, access, for example, for the high-risk patients and uh, MRI guided biopsies. 
I don't think there's any going to, going to be any big problem with the high risk patients because these are probably being seen already. But I do think we need to be careful regarding the moderate risk patients. In particular, we need to avoid a scenario where we're suddenly screening 25% of the female population. And as I say, we need to focus our resources on those that would genuinely benefit from this uh, program. And of course, everybody's favorite topic, the symptomatic breast clinics. This is actually a screenshot that I took about two years ago with the PubMed search, symptomatic breast clinic referrals. And it, you know, I was a little surprised, but perhaps when you think about it, maybe not too surprised that five of the top six papers or the most recent papers came from Ireland. And I think this indicates a level of frustration out there that has occurred since uh, the breast guidelines uh, came in in 2009 with the amalgamation of the unit. And this is one of our big sources of trouble, this form, and in particular, this box here. The triaging in effect was been done in the community. And if a GP checked this or ticked this box, the hospital was obliged to come in with a two-week referral. And this put the whole system under ferocious pressure. I think a lot of you have seen the COH data. I've presented it before. This is looking from 2010 to 2016, a huge increase in terms of the number of new patients that... Um, that were attending the clinics. Um, the number of cancers were shown during this time frame in, in red, and you can see a very similar number of cancers during this time frame, with over 3,000 extra patients coming to the clinics, which represents an increase in workload of over 28%. And during this time frame, we actually lost resources. We lost people. We didn't gain anything. And when we have these two lines diverging, uh, we have a big problem. So we certainly need to get these lines parallel to get the system back in sync again. Now, this, of course, isn't just a COH problem. This is national data from 2006 to 2021. Again, look at the number of cancers. They're very similar figures overall over during that 15 year time frame shown here in orange. But yet the number of patients we're seeing nationally to diagnose these cancers has doubled. And the longer I stay in medicine, the more emphasis I seem to see on uh, patients with benign disease rather than those with serious illnesses. And this, of course, isn't just a CUH problem. This is data from 2015 to 2021, so a slightly later time frame than what I've showed you already. And in fact, you can see in the CUH data, actually, uh, we peaked a little bit before some of the other hospitals. But you can see in most of the units, there is just an ongoing increased number of patients coming in. And for new patient urgent referrals, our cancer detection rate is in the region of 9.5%. So 10 to one benign to malignant ratio, which I think is probably reasonably acceptable. However, if you look at the non-urgent referrals, again, huge volumes of patients being seen, huge numbers throughout every single uh, designated unit, but our cancer detection rate is less than 1%. It's just 0.9%. And this approximates what you get on the incident screening round, the initial screening round and breast check. So a huge resource here being, sent on, being spent on benign disease. Now, looking at some Irish data in particular, this is a, a study from Galway looking at over 1,000 consecutive referrals. Very poor correlation between the GP triage category request and those assigned in the breast clinic. And over about 61% of cases, there was discordance between what was indicated in the GP referral form and what was found in the breast clinic. And this isn't just unique to, the, uh, to, to, to Galway, it's across the country. And there was indeed a, a paper in the Ulster Medical Journal looking at Northern Ireland data in 2011 showing something similar. What about nostalgia? Well, one of the questions when we were looking at the guidelines is whether nostalgia could be managed in primary care as it accounted for about 24% of our referrals. Again, a big Irish study, nearly 6,000 patients. This time it's patients from uh, Beaumont and Galway and only 1.2% of these patients were diagnosed with cancer. So nostalgia is not a symptom of breast cancer. All of these patients were over 35 years of age. Similar data from uh, Ottawa and Canada, cancer detection rate of less than 1% uh, for people um, uh, presenting with nostalgia. Paper in the British Journal of General Practice in 2020 saying breast pain can usually be safely managed in the primary care setting. And uh, a paper just published last month looking at um, 1,972 nostalgia patients in the UK, and their cancer detection rate was just 0.4%. So. 
mastalgia can be safely managed in primary care. The GPs now have a facility to request a mammogram only appointment, and this should be after they've explored routine treatments such as uh, evening primrose oil and, and, and so on. Now, for the symptomatic patients, the GPs can send the patients in for the symptomatic clinic appointment. They have to tick a box indicating now that they have seen and examine the patients themselves. They have to give some details about the lump. And of course, this is the form that we see. Now, some of these forms can be difficult enough to read. This, for example, has been changed to a bullet point uh, scenario, which is slightly easier to read. Now, the current status, well, th this system is in place since April 2021. It's actually difficult to evaluate the system uh, due to COVID and due to the cyber attack. We certainly need to get validated data the initial impression, though, is that there is a stabilization in terms of the referrals coming through. Over 99% of referrals are now electronic, which makes data management somewhat easier. And about 10% of these referrals are requests for mammography only. Now, finally, just one quick slide on the KPIs. I think we need to look at the KPIs again. Certainly, the only KPI that seems to have been interest to the powers that be has been the access KPIs. And this is a very crude measure of the quality of the service. And again, this is something that's planned over the coming few months. So just to summarize, thank you for your attention this morning. I think there's a lot of good work done on the breast services nationally, but to paraphrase a general election slogan from several years ago, a lot done, a lot more to do. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for that uh, really comprehensive overview of, of the current issues. Uh, in breast surgery. And I'm going to move on now. We'll take our questions at the end. Uh, what I'm going to do now is bring up probably the biggest controversy at the moment is about the issue of general surgery on call. So breast surgeons of my generation all traditionally uh, did on call. And if you look to our colleagues in the UK, uh, that would not happen nowadays. They're not on the on-call rota. It's a very different practice. And we, as a small country, need to come to grips with this. And we have two people to debate this today. The first is going to be Louise Kelly, who's going to say why I should not be on the general surgery call, Rosa. Louise, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Ernie. Can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can hear you. And your screen has been shared, but I don't have the slides up yet. So just work away and I'll let you know when they're up. We've seen the beautiful frog. There are your slides. Perfect. You're up. Go for it. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to talk on this consent, contentious issue. Um, but I'm going to give you my experience of why I am not on call for general surgery. And it boils down to the fact that I have had no elective general surgery practice since 2009. This has had a significant impact on skills maintenance and led to my withdrawal from the general surgery emergency rota in 2019, 10 years after I was appointed. So here I am in 2009, appointed as a general surgeon with a special interest in breast and endocrine surgery. My appointment was a new appointment. There was no inherited resources. It came about because of reconfiguration of cancer services and in particular, the moving of breast patients from Kerry to Cork. So whatever my expectations and aspirations for the post were, this is what I was actually resourced to do. And I'm showing you my weekly schedule from 2010 because I had returned from maternity leave in June 2010. So the only actual resource that I had for general surgery came a good year after my appointment when I threatened to come off the call rota at that point. And that was because I had no facility for reviewing my post-call patients. So I did get a clinic with 10 slots for return patients only, uh, one room with no nursing support and limited administration support. I had a theatre list supported by three beds. I had the full uh, symptomatic triple assessment clinic supported by radiology and a return clinic. And our MDTs are on Thursdays. I had started rooms in 2010 and these gaps in the rota or the weekly schedule were essentially filled because when I came back from maternity leave, I was asked to take on the role of clinical lead of the symptomatic service at that time. I was possibly a bit green, but I did do it enthusiastically. And so these empty slots were filled with administration with regards to that 
And then on retirement of one of our colleagues, I occupied his um, theatre list and his clinic so as to keep those resources for our next appointee. In 2012, I applied for what was always my dream job, a breast check screening post combined with symptomatic service. This was in the Southern unit. It was 21 hours for breast check and 16 hours specifically for the symptomatic unit. What this actually did was it effectively meant that CUH were no longer contractually obliged to provide me with any general surgery resource. So what I had at the time, I kept what I didn't have, I was never going to get. And then the gaps in my schedule quickly became filled with breast check workload. I did manage to hold on to the general clinic once a month. And this second theatre on a Friday didn't actually materialise until 2018. And it's a shared list with another colleague. So it's six, six years after I took up this appointment. So, you know, in the region, the landscape of acute surgical care was changing. We'd had the closure of emergency departments in 2012 of the South Infirmary Victoria University Hospital, Mallow and Bantry, with a significant impact on emergency care in CUH and in the Mercy Hospital. And as a result, we had many discussions with regards to how we'd manage this workload. We talked about a citywide and a countywide rota, a buddy system with first and second on call, surgeon of the week, etc. Essentially, nothing changed and we remained on a one in eight on call in CUH. Surgeon of the week didn't appeal to me, to be fair, because as much operating as I was doing every second Thursday, if I did no general surgery at all for two months and then was expected to take care of the sickest and vulnerable patients for a week, I don't think that would have inspired confidence in myself. Our vascular surgery colleagues came off the general rota in 2017, dropping us to a one in six. And at the same time, we evaluated how we could deliver service differently. And that led to the emergence of emergency acute surgeons, uh, of whom we have now four approved posts. Uh, three people are in post already, and one is due to commence later on this summer. And um, that has made a significant impact on the delivery of care. And I'll come back to that later. But it has also had an effect on my own personal practice. So this is my theatre register and looking at 2009 when I was first appointed to 2013. Uh, I did manage to get 20 uh, breast surgeries done before I went to maternity leave, including a latissimus dorsi reconstruction. My single solitary elective general surgery procedure was a lap coli before I went on maternity leave. And then everything thereafter every other year is a big fat zero. If I could bring your attention to these figures in brackets, these are patients that I operated on, but not on my scheduled list. So I had to squeeze them in somewhere else when colleagues went on holidays, uh, when there was a, a spare theatre slot. So although I was expected to deliver this elective breast surgery component, I wasn't even resourced to do that. I do operate on a Monday, so I'm subject to bank holidays, and we were having theatre closures during this period. So, you know, these changes also came with an evolution of uh, emergency care, and the lack of resources compounded my ability to engage with emergency care. So, it, our single um, emergency theatre is shared by all surgical specialties. It's not general surgery alone. Um, there's been an increased move towards the laparoscopic approach, but you know that requires regular practice to maintain competence. And the complex caseload has just really increased over the decade. Uh, we're operating on much more elderly patients with significant comorbidities and a lot more complexity. CUH has long felt itself to be a level one trauma centre, even though the designation only officially came through in 2021. And, you know, that has brought a significant workload and that's only going to increase with this official designation. And emergency surgery does require emergency anaesthetic support, which has faced its own challenges in skills maintenance in our unit. So if we go back to my logbook again, so 2012 is when I changed contract. The a &E departments closed. There's a significant amount of breast work being done on my service. Absolutely no elective general surgery. 
and my emergency service, there's some key uh, procedures there, uh, it increased and decreased. In 2017, the vascular surgeons come off call and we initiate the uh, development of the emergency acute surgery service. In 2018, I finally get my second theatre and you can see that my breast workload is still quite huge. And even through COVID, uh, the numbers of people undergoing operations are fairly uh, substantial. So in 2019, by the time I came off the general surgery rota, I had not performed an emergency laparotomy for the preceding 14 months. All this time, our breast practice is being very heavily audited. So since returning from maternity leave in 2010, we've been returning all our KPIs. There was a quote on how many breast surgery cases we had to look after per year to be considered suitable to remain within breast surgery. And the KPIs, as Martin has discussed earlier, in the breast check scenario, there's even more uh, scrutiny, particularly looking at the specimen weight and diagnostic surgery, the number of nodes removed at central node biopsy, the number of surgeries the patient undergoes to um, get to final clear margins and our mastectomy rate. But when I, sorry, when I look at my emergency surgery workload, again, the most vulnerable and sick patients, the only data or area for gaining support is at our monthly morbidity and mortality conference. And I had a big issue with the discrepancy between the almost over scrutiny of the breast service and the under scrutiny of the emergency surgery service. So we don't work in a vacuum and there were other influences um, that helped to focus my mind particularly. I suppose the uh, issue of complexity and volume, uh, the spotlight first came on that for surgery in the Port Leash report, which was a report into the maternity services. Uh, our own emergency surgery team presented at the ADSGBI with regards to improvement in the acute surgical service in the CUH, in particular reduced length of stay, reduced readmission rate, the reduced time to get to theatre, the increased utilisation of our one single emergency theatre. Um, and these were all very positive outcomes for the patient, but clearly had an effect on my operative experience out of hours. So by the time the NALI uh, paper was published showing volume and in-hospital mortality after emergency abdominal surgery, I was most definitely identifying as a low volume surgeon in a high volume center. The other influences include coroner's court, which you know should be who died, when they died and what they died of. But in fact, it can be a very adversarial uh, situation to be in. And annually, we run a prep for med course for transition year students. And I, uh, because I share an office with Professor Mark Cargan, who chairs that whole event, I get to give the ethical talk to the medical student, the school students every year. And so I'm constantly reviewing the medical council's uh, professional conduct and ethics. And very clearly, it states that my duty of care is to the patient, not to my hospital manager and not to my colleagues. Um, you know, the call of my contract is at the discretion of my clinical director. And I did have an incident where in 2017, having performed a splenectomy every year to that point, I had a patient come in who had a grade five laceration to the spleen. It wasn't embolizable. It, she needed a splenectomy. She was 13, but she was six foot tall. But once my anaesthetic colleague, who was also the clinical director for the South South West group at the time, heard that I was taking a paediatric patient to theatre for a splenectomy, they insisted that I get in a hepatobiliary surgeon. Now, to be fair, splenectomy is a bread and butter emergency general surgery procedure. And if I'm not capable of doing that, well, then I should not be on the rota. So we had a big powwow afterwards and he apologised for casting any aspersions on my clinical abilities. but. You know, it marks your card and gives you insight that one, there'll be no HSE support because we've all seen our clinical colleagues being thrown under the bus there. There'll be no managerial CUH support. There'll be no medical legal support. And, you know, there may not be any collegial support either, depending on what the catastrophe is that has happened. 
So yes, I'm not on general surgery call, but I do provide breast call and it would be wrong to think in any way that this is onerous. We do have a co-located maternity hospital and we see a lot of new mums with significant lactational abscesses. We manage the acute presentations of metastatic breast cancer. We manage our post-operative complications and this has made significant improvements for our own patient cohort because we've managed to decrease emergency admissions. These patients generally don't need to be in patients. They can be managed radiologically with drainage, with antibiotics, but you know they come directly to us now. They don't have to go through another service and we manage breast trauma. And you know, yes, it's not an onerous rotor, but I've had two patients in HDU in the past month with seatbelt injuries and massive breast hematomas. It's a one in five rotor we do a week at a time. Our breast registrar holds the beep from eight to five and the on-call reg is on after five. So we've reduced the workload on our emergency surgery colleagues. So with all of these things, there's always an elephant in the room. And I think in this particular situation, there's a herd of them. Uh, coming off call has meant a financial loss in earnings for myself of between 20 and 30,000 euro. I don't do rooms anymore. I gave that up in 2012 because I didn't have the theatre capacity to offer rooms patients anything better than I could offer through the public service. CUH aren't known to be great at capturing patients who have um, um, medical insurance. So these loss of earnings could actually be higher in other institutions. Um, I've been criticized for uh, our trainees situation and, you know, oh, they're not getting the same exposure to general surgery. Well, our SPR post is approved for the end of training, for specialist training. And you can see from my figures alone, and I'm one of six um, surgeons in the breast unit in CUH, there's plenty of breast work going through, including oncoplastics, etc. cetera. Uh, we have managed to establish a fellowship program and then with regards to collegiality, which is the other criticism that's often levied at me, uh, you know, we didn't just up and leave the rota. We did look at the business plan, the funding, uh, and thanks to Professor Mark Cargan for all the work he did on getting the emergency surgery service established. And as I say, it's now four permanent appointments, three of whom are already in post and one who's due to take it up. So in summary, the reason I'm not on general call is a lack of resources since 2009. The contract change in 2012, which effectively meant that I did not need to be resourced by my host hospital anymore. Reconfiguration of emergency care in the region with NCHD recruitment difficulties. The loss of the vascular surgeons from the road to triggering a crisis, which led to the development of the emergency acute surgical service. And while a great service has an impact on my own personal operating out of hours and my patient safety concerns. And I was watching the Liverpool-Manchester City match there two weekends ago, the final score 3-2, and I found it very impressive that Alan Shearer was giving out about one of these multi-million dollar footballers because he's had no game time, therefore that equals per performance. And in my mind, no elective general surgery performance equals very likely poor emergency surgery performance. So thanks to everybody for listening. I would particularly like to thank these colleagues, Morgan McCourt, who had the unfortunate um, role of being either before or after me on the rota. So he was likely in the county and he always picked up the phone when I called, no matter what time of day or night. Adrian O'Sullivan, who's primarily in the Mercy Hospital, but would coordinate bank holiday weekends with me so that I had somebody else to call. Akbar Zulkernan, who's medical... Um, gastroenterologist who came for all the hematemesis and Fuad Aftab and Yasser Kayal who took a uh, call from me when it was becoming unsustainable and Norma Relihan for being in the breast clinic when I couldn't be because I was in emergency theatre and of course it wouldn't have all been possible without our SPRs and registrars too who kept the, the show on the road for the 10 years that I was involved. Thank you. Thank you very much Louise that was a superb uh history of why you're now off the rota and some incredible uh, important issues there i really feel for you at the time of when you uh, met your anesthetic colleague who said you couldn't do a splenectomy that's a real uh, moment uh, to reflect on and I, I think it's been a very challenging journey and lots of interesting lessons
Let's move on to Jerry O'Donoghue, who has a very different story to tell. Jerry, uh, do you want to take it and tell us why you think you should be on the rota? Hi, Jerry. If you want to um, pop on your camera. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you all right. If you pop on your video, go to the bottom left of the screen, pop on your video, and then share your screen. Yeah, um, my video is pro, um, and those pressing is give me a few seconds. Uh, okay, you you're getting me? there. We we can see your picture coming up, Jerry. So that's that's good start. I know Jerry talked earlier about breaking through the firewalls in Waterford. That it was easier for Putin to get through. I have I have video now. Jerry. Yeah, I you're good, and your slides are showing, Jerry. So that that's all good. If you want to take it away, if you yeah. put that on full screen, I think. Yeah, it's it's just super slow. Sorry, now the connection here. Um, okay, so that's okay. Can you see go my for it. Slides? We can see your slides and we can hear you. Can so you go right it? ahead. Yep, everything's perfect, Jerry. Go for it. Sorry now, um, I'm just about to, it's just loading up here. So um, thank you very much. I'd just like to express my thanks uh, to RCSI and to you, Arnie, and to compliment Louise on her talk. You can hear and see me? Yes, we can, Jerry. Go ahead, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm just gonna speak about why I wish to stay on general surgical call. So as mentioned, I'm a consultant breast endocrine and melanoma surgeon within the Southeast. And I'm in a one and eight rota. Um, we do acute urology call as well with urology take over the next day. We have three breast, two and a half colorectal and two and a half vascular surgeons making a one and eight. But we're soon to be a one and seven rota. Um, I suppose I just want to very briefly give you the thoughts of my outline to this talk. Um, the philosophy of my approach to this opportunity to speak to you briefly define what general surgery highlight its importance and, and also discuss its frequent anonymity. Um, so with regard to my thought process, this opportunity, it very much echoes what Louise actually spoke about, but with 360 degree opposite sort of uh, progression of my elective and emergency practice. It's important to have a balanced approach and, and ultimately we're all colleagues in this. Um, it's a mistake not to consider both sides and we've heard Louise's side very eloquently um, sort of discussed. And I think at the end, I'll come back to this at the end, but each individual surgeon will have to de decide based on the needs of their patients and their colleagues. Change is going to be gradual. Uh, and ultimately this is a democracy, it's not a dictatorship. So everyone is entitled to their absolute balanced opportunities and, and, and opinions. Very briefly to define what general surgery is. Well, it's the surgical practice that focuses on the abdominal organs. Most commonly we see herni hernia appendixes, gallbladder, large and small bowel. And for the purpose of this, I'm just going to speak about surgical intervention. And in the next few slides, I'll show you a lot of very similar data of the last nine years that I've audited my general surgical practice. The one thing to say is fundamentally, every consultant breast surgeon listening to this in Ireland is an intercollegiate certified general surgeon. You may recognize those companion series on the right side there that we use to study for the, the intercollegiate exam, but we are all licensed to practice general surgery. Um, with regard to its importance and, and its anonymity, well, some fake news that needs to be discussed. We often hear general surgery is a dying speciality. Cancer has to take priority, and I really don't have any time nor for, for the general stuff. Thankfully, that has got no real bearing in regard to, we look at the data very, very briefly. If we look at a publication um, that looks at the frequency of general emergency surgical admissions within the Irish health system, 10% of all hospital admissions, but it represents 50% of all surgical mortality. One in 10 patients who present with abdominal sepsis uh, requiring an emergency laparotomy will die. So 
we need to look at the frequency of emergent general surgery and how this is going to impact in the next sort of 10, 15 years. In the last 10 years, there's been a one third increase in emergency general surgical uh, admissions within the Irish health system. If you look at the US data, it represents more hospital admissions, emergency general surgery wise, than the diagnosis of cancer and diabetes. I was recently at, 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 a, at a meeting, not in this institution, but, but within the Southeast, where I was asked by a senior manager, did I still do general surgery? They thought it was done by someone else because none of the breast surgeons in their hospital were doing it. And I was asked, why do I want to do it? And I nearly felt like I had to ask permission to continue it and to justify it. So hopefully in the next few slides, I'll be able to show you that. Um, if you look at this lovely monk and this picture at the bottom, he's in a Zen moment, apparently. And I believe that to continue on emergency general surgical call, you need to have that balance, that Zen moment. It lies in the desire to maintain an elective general workload without compromising your special interest. And I'll just say this with regard to the general workload. You really have to try and strive for it. You have to make every opportunity available for yourself to increase your general elective workload because that will complement how you perform emergency general surgery as a breast surgeon. I'm going to talk about how this elective workload complements the emergency surgical procedure and I'm going to concentrate on a few things. The endoscopic skills, how elective endoscopic skills complement emergency ones, how elective abdominal wall skills complement emergency uh, repairs of abdominal wall defects and how laparoscopic skills complement emergency laparoscopic skills. But I'm not going to, to ignore the special interest because I think a lot of people listening to this will worry, well, if you do all this emergency general elective surgery, how do you complement your special interests? And I'll speak about what I do, which is the melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancers, the sentinel biopsies, primary hyperparathyroidism, and I'll briefly touch on breast cancer, but that's a huge topic. Um, so with regard to the elective endoscopy skills, all the bar charts you're going to see in the next few slides, they're an audit of my last nine years of data. So if I look at my OGDs per year, between about 50 to 70 per year in this institution and in other institutions. And these elective skills translate immediately to emergency skills. So as Louise spoke about the upper GI bleeding, my experience with that is you need three things. You need an experienced anesthetist. You need a large bore NG, large bore NG washout, endoclips and hemostatic agents. And nearly always, this will solve the issue. Pharaseal bleeds, they're rare. They're good fun when they happen, but they're challenging. And the key is to band, use a send stack and if needed, and get the liver gastro specialist involved ASAP. Your emergency elective skills complement the emergency skills. And here's just an example of, of a one euro coin lodged in an esophagus in a child. Again, you need an experienced anesthetist. It's, it's super important to have a foreign body kit and take your time. You might look at, well, colonoscopy and how does that really translate itself to emergency general surgery? And it probably doesn't, but it does improve your skills. So here, here is an example of my yearly colonoscopy figures between 80 to 100 per year. Um, and the majority of the time, you don't really need to use that in the emergency situation. This is all obviously auditors and the NICWAS program. We're all familiar with those of us who do endoscopy. And uh, the most recent report showed that there were 745 endoscopists doing approximately 80,000 colonoscopies and 80,000 OGDs in the, in the country. Here is the data from last year for me, and I have a 100% sequent intubation rate and a 30% polyp detection rate. Now the numbers are low due to COVID, but, but that's what you want to be, to, to be hitting. And where do I use this in the emergency surgery? It's, it's often in the semi-obstructing colon cancer. So I'll just take a few seconds just to compliment these three fine guys on the right here. These are the two Peters and Faker who are the three colorectal surgeons in this hospital. And the emergent colorectal obstructing colon cancer has pretty much faded away thanks to these three guys. They will perform an emergency stent for, for any of us on call if they're within the country. So this is an example of how you can use your colleagues to get you out of a situation that maybe is better managed by them if you've got a good relationship. If I now move on to the elective abdominal wall versus emergency hernia, I do a lot of inguinal hernias and my go-to mesh is the ProGrip mesh there. If I look at my data over the last nine years, about 30 to 40 open inguinal hernias um, 
over the last nine years per year. This translates itself to the emergency surgical skills where you have a patient like this presenting with a CT scan of an emergency obstructed inguinal hernia. They need an operation. They need one ASAP. They don't need a reduction. They don't need conservative management. And these elective transferable skills to the emergency situation are extremely important. When we look at femoral epigastric hernias, they're less common, but I might do about 10 or 12 a year. And they again translate themselves to something like this, an emergency femoral hernia that's been marked out by myself or the trainee. And you can see the CT scan. These have to be operated on and your elective skills in the groin allow you to do these comfortably as an emergency um, case. I've done some laparoscopic ventral hernia repairs, and this is just some nice pictures of a small defect using a suture passer to close it with three of sutures and then using a barred mesh um, to, to repair. And then your umbilical work. Here's an example. This was last week. So this was a an incarcerated hernia, you could call it. And, and my elective experience using the Ventriflex mesh on the right hand side there allows you to deal with this in the emergency situation. So these are all transferable skills. And the more of this you do, the more comfortable one should be with emergency general surgical um, procedures. But it's important to come back to the special interest. And I'm going to flip over and back during this talk that this does not suffer. As I say, if I look at the melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer practice I have, it's important to maintain this interest. What I do in the Southeast is I do, I suppose, the bigger cases that don't require specialist plastic surgical input, but are maybe a little bit too hot for the, or too difficult for the, the dermatologists. Um, and you can see that the numbers per year we're about 50 to 60, and they're exponentially increasing in the last few years as, as we get more dermatologists. In the 2016, 2017 year, that's when we lost a lot of dermatologists here. And if I look at the, the wider excisions of the melanoma, a lot of us with regard to breast might do some of this, and these are sort of the pictures you get, and they're from a dermatology and a GP source. And the numbers here again are significant, about 40 to 50 per year, uh, with, with very little variation. Um, it's important to audit your research, your, your work. It's important that your peers review it. And here's an example just of a snapshot of a five-year audit of the melanoma margins within the Southeast that was published a few years ago. Um, some nice skills to have electively to allow you to do this and have enough time to do it are very simple rotational flaps. Now, I know Jamie Martin-Smith will probably look at this and go, this is this really kind of, you know, basic level. It's, it's entry level, but it allows you as me, I should say, as, as a general and special surgeon to provide surgical service to these neglected skin cancers without the need for a plastic surgeons. And then skin grafting, you know, some eight to 15 a year or so, Again, a useful skill to have, and it's super important to maintain specialist interest. This was a very interesting case I, I found. Uh, so this is a squamous cell carcinoma with a pseudoaneurysm on the superficial temporal artery. The vascular surgeons took care of that, and I uh, grafted it, and we got a nice result. So it's essential to not allow compromise of your elective workload while you provide emergency surgical care. Um, but it's important to know your limits. And, and I, I really want to mention again my colleagues in this particular a uh, chap uh, called Gareth Higgins, who's an oculoplastic surgeon in the Southeast, and he does wonderful work. So when I get referred to something like this on the left, I say, no, this is not for me. He does a nice advancement flap. So again, like the colorectal surgeons, you utilize your colleagues to allow you to maintain your balance uh, while appropriate patient care. Continuous education is super important, and, and I've done many courses in the Royal College of Surgeons. I'd like to particularly speak about the STS course that Morgan McMonagall runs for surgical trauma and, and, and whatever important flap uh, reconstruction textbooks that we would all read. So that, that goes without saying. Um, if I look again, I suppose, at other parts of the special interest that one must maintain while doing emergency general surgery, sentinel node biopsies. Now this data here this is an example of a lymphocytogram, <clears throat> excuse me, um, showing a melanoma scar injection and a subsequent sentinel node. And, and within this hospital in UHW, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful nuclear medicine department where same day lymphocytography is, is without question so easily obtained. And that's made a massive difference to me for, for, for my practice. Um, example of a positive sentinel node. And these are the number of sentinel node melanomas I perform. I'm the only one here who does this. 
and this excludes any of the breast stuff. So about say say 17 to 20 per year. I perform well. I had performed all the groin clearances for these patients over the last nine years, but the MSLT2 trial has removed this with regard to management of node positive melanoma. So now most of these patients undergo observation. But here's an example of, of a picture from maybe two years ago where I'm about to flip the sartorius flap over the great vessels after uh, dealing with the femoral triangle. So these general surgical skills are very, very important that you can maintain them, but also bring them to emergency surgical practice when needed. Again, audit and research and, and five-year experience of a cutaneous melanoma. So it's again, it's important to, to, to make sure that everything is being audited. And, and as um, Monty Python would say, for something completely different, well, another specialist interest I have is primary hyperparathyroidism. And I do all these surgeries for the patients in the Southeast. So for the four hospitals in the Southeast, uh, and here's an example for those that don't know much about this. This is a specialist ultrasound showing a parathyroid adenoma in the left lower pole. It says to me, be scan showing increased take up. And, and we've recently pioneered here three phase CT scanning. So all these patients can have all their imaging in the majority time within this hospital. An example of a parathyroid adenoma resection. Um, an ipsilateral normal gland with a normal calcium and PTH on the same day. So these again are something that one specialist interest wise I can do while still providing emergency surgery. The numbers per year, they're low, but for those who practice this, they probably appreciate this is a rare disease. I might do about 10 or 11 per year. COVID had really affected these in the last two years. And <clears throat> I'm very grateful to my uh, nephrology, urology and, and endocrine colleagues that are referring more of these to me um, and hopefully more in the future. Let's go back to the elective workload again and how this re reflects on emergency general surgery. And this is where it becomes really important. Louise spoke about laparoscopic skills and if you don't maintain these electively, then you cannot hope to provide emergency laparoscopic surgery. And she's absolutely right. This is a gallbladder I did two days ago. So very, very simple callous triangle cystic duct when it's easy, it is fantastic. Um, but when it's difficult, sorry, these are the numbers. I might do about 30 to 40 per year over the last nine years. And as I say, it's straightforward most of the time. But when it's not, what I've learned, and I'd like to share this, I suppose, with everyone, is that an acute gallbladder, if in doubt, get out. Don't open the patient. Put in big drains and, and call the battery biliary, patabiliary. I've started using IESG, which is it's a useful adjunct. It's basically a dye taken up by the, the biliary system. And you can see how it just shows in the bottom right, the CBD there. It's not a replacement for anatomy, common sense and knowledge, but it is useful. And if I just for a second talk about elective acute gallbladders, it's not truly emergency surgery, but a lot of acute gallbladders are, are, are challenging. I've had two duct of Lushka leaks and one cystic dump cystic duct stump leak over the last nine years and I'd like to just have a, a brief moment to, to compliment my HBB colleagues in the Mercy who have been at the end of the phone. These cases shorten a surgeon's lifespan. They keep us awake at night. They are challenging. What have I learned? Early washout, put in big drains, ERCP and contact the HBB and you can get your IR colleagues, and we have three really good IR colleagues in UHW, to drain stuff, to stick cholecystotomy tubes in, uh, and, and again, refer to HBB. This all leads to how one deals with the simple appendix. People just dismiss appendicitis as something to be, you know, it's trivial. It's not. If you look at the numbers per year, they're static over the last nine years for me, about 30. An operation, when it's done well, it's effortless. But when it's done poorly and pelvic abscesses start coming to your door in young children, then you have to look at your numbers. So it's important to keep the elective laparoscopic skills up to enable to provide a really good emergency uh, appendix service. It's interesting if you look at the number of diagnostic laparoscopies I've performed in the last nine years, they've pretty much fallen off the charts. Obviously with COVID they have, but if you exclude that, they really have gone away and that's because of, of advanced CT scanning, advanced imaging and good radiology here, where you're saying, what is the appendix? Is it appendicitis? Look at the appendix and give me a report. Um, Perf, do you? I don't see them anymore. I, I, I might do one a year. 
The last one I did, uh, I actually did laparoscopically, washed out, just confirmed the omentum was actually on the defect and, and didn't need to open the patient. So really it's, it's a disease that's nearly gone away with PPI therapy. And this, I suppose, is a slide that looks at the number of laparotomies per year. And, and, and we, we all need to speak about this, particularly in light of Mr. Mealy's paper in the BMJ, which shows that if you had less than 30 procedures over four to five years, you were in a low surgeon volume category and you had an increased number of deaths per thousand cases. And if you look at my numbers and you add them up over four or five years, they are under 30. They, they barely reach 20. But if I have, and sorry, when, and I've had two anastomotic leaks, that's where your colorectal colleagues come in. And it'd be a shame to remove oneself from the emergency surgical rota because of something like this, when you can see all the advantages you can give in the preceding slides. But this does require, I suppose, further discussion about who might deal with the acute laparotomy if your numbers are low volume. This is an example uh, a few months ago of a patient who presented, she was 35 year old Brazilian, presented with acute pneumoperitoneum, a CT scan showed a Hinchley grade two or three. The radiologist couldn't really tell this is her sigmoid colon undersurface. And you can just see the beginning of a small little defect. And then I explored it, obviously, laparoscopically. Um, and when we explored it more, there's a super thin mucosal surface or serosal surface between the colon and the outside new peritoneum. I debated what I would do. I, I, I suppose in my mind was, was, was the need to avoid a heart mount procedure in a young lady. So what we do, copious washout. Redivax, IV antibiotics, sequential CT scanning. And I discharged her from my care only two weeks ago. She was delighted. And we all got a bottle of tequila actually from her because she was Brazilian. So again, it's important to, to, to think outside the box and, and use modern management of acute surgery procedures. If we look at breast cancer, and I could speak about this for 20 minutes, but I'm not going to. It's so important to maintain one special interest. And Louise has already spoke about cancers one should perform as a breast surgeon. Now, I am not in a screening unit. I am in a symptomatic unit. So my numbers of referrals will be half of the, the screening service. But any breast surgeon at a breast center must carry out primary surgery on at least 50 new diagnosed breast cancers. Here's my numbers. The red are those that I have operated on and the blues are those that I have diagnosed. And if you look at my numbers, I'm on the 50%, the 50 cases per year, um, level. And that's where my colleagues also within this unit are, or they're slightly higher. Um, the number of mastectomies versus wide local, as it should, approximately one third to two thirds. So you can see that I am able to maintain my breast cancer workload while still doing emergency surgery and special interest. It's important again to publish. And here's a recent publication uh, that we collaborated with other institutes within Ireland on, on in, in the breast field. So um, the cornerstone to finish of all this is MDT and m, &M. We had one this morning at 7.15. Uh, and, and I know Louise spoke about how she felt that the local m, &M may not have been sufficient. So I present my data monthly at the local m, &M and There's a, a sort of snapshot from a few years ago. Within the Southeast, we present all our data on a six monthly basis at varying geographical locations for all the four hospitals. And we have done so under the auspices of Ken Mealy for the last 12 years since I've started. Obviously, um, Martin mentioned the NCCP um, data presentations and we also presented the Irish Melanoma Forum. So MDT and m, &M is the cornerstone. I just come to Where wrap up I there, Jerry, if I could. Just Thanks. finish. The few um, historically, it was always about if you could operate or not, but the future is different. The future is going to have technological, scientific, professional and regulatory demands. What I haven't included here is what the, the psychology of the surgeon is. But really, to summarize, it will depend on the need of the community, the need of the hospitals and the need of the surgeon. As Louise mentioned, what about the surgeon of the weak model? Where is the regional trauma centers going to come in? And our colleagues and very finally this is a snapshot of a talk that's probably happening right now at the charter day and it says how to prevent the colorectal surgeon 
becoming the de facto emergency surgeon. So it's a very important to have a balanced approach. And I just like finally to thank Catherine Slattery, who was very instrumental in this data, Nora Ann, our breast manager. And here's a picture on the right of our Waterford October surgical meeting last year. And, and I'd encourage anyone who can come to, to this meeting this year. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kerry. Appreciate that. An excellent oversight. And my gosh, you're busy. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And we'll have questions at the end. I'm going to proceed right away to Jamie Martin-Smith. He's one of our newest plastic surgeons in uh, Beaumont Hospital. And his special interest is in the area of DF reconstruction. He's joined my colleague Nadim Ajmal, who does these as well. And uh, Jamie has had, uh, it's been a pleasure working with Jamie over the last year technically a brilliant surgeon, and uh, we're delighted to hear his views on Dieppe reconstruction. Jamie, it's all yours. Thank you, Arnie. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you see me? We can see you, yes. And if you want to upload your slides. Uh, yeah. yeah, should be good to go. Yeah, we've got your slides and carry on and we can hear you. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm very grateful to you and the panelists and to everyone else here for letting me talk at your parallel session. Um, it's good to be able to talk to the other specialty that I spend a lot of time with and to be able to talk in detail about what I do. Um, so my plan for this talk is just to give you a little bit of oversight on how I see reconstruction and my, my philosophies on it. Um, and then talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in Beaumont. And as some of you are aware, we have a really I would put it a thriving ot autologous reconstruction unit and there's a good few factors behind that so I thought I might just lay out why I think that's running really well and possibly what we should be doing uh, in other centres to maybe move towards that. So cancer reconstruction in general for us is you know there's a hole we have to close the hole we have to make everything work again and at the end of the day then we start worrying about cosmesis. And that's what we do on limbs and faces and things like that, because you got to get them closed first. The difference, obviously, with the mastectomy is there is no defect. It's, you know, a non-functioning reconstruction that we want to make. And so, you know, the, <clears throat> the first two objectives are, you know, null and void. And the objective from the breast, you know, from the breast cancer side of, of things is just get rid of the cancer and the high-risk tissue get through recovery as quick as you can and get on to adjuvant treatment if, if needed uh, with as minimal um, complications as possible. So reconstruction is just an aesthetic operation. If you think about that, we're not doing anything that recreates a physical function, um, but then function derives from form. So the function of the breast for these patients is, psycholo is psych psychological and uh, you know, a, a feeling of completing treatment and getting back to their old self. <clears throat> An aesthetic operation then is also about the, you know, the beauty aspect of it, and that's in the eye of the beholder. And what we see from a technical point of view sometimes makes me really happy. I might do a great big operation and I'm pleased with the technical aspect, but if it doesn't look good to the patient at the end of the day, there's no real point in it. Which me, leads me to say that uh, creating an asymmetrical breast is dead easy. I mean, we can all stick an implant in and create a breast mount with cleavage. And that's essentially a breast reconstruction. There's you know, more of an art to creating a symmetrical implant-based reconstruction, uh, something which I don't think I'm the best at, and definitely a lot of you in the audience are probably better than me at. Um, but this, the idea is trying to create a, a plan for the patient to end up with an aesthetic symmetry or one they're happy with, and that's the surgical aim. Autologous reconstruction, it's well documented. It gives better cosmetic results. It's a better lifelong outcome, but there is a significant sacrifice. You can see in that picture, she's got a super outcome from uh, a tumor involving the skin in the upper outer quadrant that I replaced with Dieppe skin and we kept the nipple and I uh, connected up the thracodorsal vessels. So it was all done laterally, but she's got a really nasty scar on her abdomen. That is the sacrifice. And nowadays autologous reconstruction should work. Uh, really our, our, our rates of loss are really, really low. So we should be looking at other things like donor site morbidity, early recovery, and the aesthetics. There's a good paper in JAMA. There's loads of good papers showing that autologous reconstructions give better outcomes in the long term. And that's just one example of it. Yeah, I think it was Martin in his talk mentioned DEPS being the gold standard. And the gold standard is a procedure that's widely recognized as the best available, but we're not doing a cancer operation. 
we're not doing a functional reconstruct. So what do we mean by a gold standard? Because at the end of the day, the gold standard is what the patient wants. And if the patient doesn't want a big scar in their abdomen, then it's not the gold standard. So we have to be careful when we say that the gold standard is a DF, right? So I tell patients that it depends on how much effort they want to put in or sacrifice they want to make. The more sacrifice they make, the better a reconstruction I can make for them. But I, I don't really like the phrase gold standard because it's, it's not patient-based and the patient decides. There's many patients who will do really well with implant-based reconstruction because it's straightforward and there's a personal cost. So implants, they're straight off the shelf. The patient doesn't have to pay anything in terms of personal or psychological sacrifice. Whereas the DF flap is really good outcomes, but you got to get this big scar on a tummy that potentially you don't want a scar on. And there's obviously some people with a, you know, a panis or something overhanging that are more than happy to take the abdominal scar to get rid of that extra bit of fat. But in general, the better candidate is someone with a small panis. Uh, so it's important, you know, we talk about the sacrifice uh, versus this idea of a gold standard. And again, this is someone who had initially done very well with an implant-based reconstruction. But when you look at her abdomen, she's had four kids and it's badly stretched and things. And while I've put a big scar on her abdomen, I've now given her a much better breast from the ruptured implant that she had. And her abdomen is a much better contour to the point that she's more than happy to take a scar. So my background in breast reconstruction came from the Royal Marsden. So I went there to do a microsurgery fellowship. I was keen on the technical aspect of things. And I really got into the, you know, the whole psych psychology, you know, the, you know, the, the, the point of breast reconstruction over there, because it was just done really well. And like here, the, the stakeholders are the breast surgeons. That's who the patients come in to see. And we're like an adjunct after that, once the patient shows that they want a reconstruction. All the implant work was done by the breast team over there. And then all the autologous reconstruction was done by us. And I think this is a really good model that each unit around the country should be pushing towards. Um, I'm a firm believer in the mastectomy flaps being slightly thicker in the breast surgeon that does their own implant-based reconstruction. To me, it doesn't matter. If I put a DEP in, it doesn't matter how thin they are. And you know, I'm pretty lucky, pretty much all the skin flaps I get handed always survive, but there is, um, a difficulty in implant reconstruction if you have really thin skin flaps. And so breast surgeons controlling your own pockets and controlling your own uh, excision margins lead to better outcomes. And I think it's also great to progress breast surgery as in, in, in following on from all those talks as an independent specialty. And part of that has to be implant-based reconstruction, I think, and you know therapeutic mammoplasties and these kind of things. So from there, I've, I've moved to Beaumont where I do the full range of things. So breast reconstruction is my main side gig, but I also have to do all the skin cancers. I do all the trauma uh, with my colleagues and then I do some cosmetic on the side as well. Um, so I'm pretty lucky in that the unit that I happened to fall into in Beaumont coming back from the UK is of a similar ethos. Uh, and Arnie has done brilliantly to, you know, fundraise and to spearhead the new breast building, which is going to be our home for the next couple of decades. Uh, and these are the main surgical stakeholders down the bottom of column. I'll have to apologize. He's a tough man to track down on Google Images. And I thought about just filling it with pictures of Arnie because there's many, many, many of them. But um, no, so apologies to Colm. But essentially, I came back to a unit that has a very pro autologous reconstruction attitude. And I also came back to a unit that uh, already had autologous uh, things running. Uh, and the fact that we're not a screening unit, the fact that we're a symptomatic unit means a lot of these patients require radiotherapy and a lot of them are more advanced, which means an autologous is, is in general a better option. Uh, we're also probably biased towards autologous in that I, I can do a better job using tissues. So I, I, I tell patients I'm biased, but I will always push them into autologous if I think they, you know, they're suitable for it. In Beaumont in the last year, we've had 80 patients, 37 immediate, 43 delayed, 104 flaps, uh, zero failure rates with two return to theater. Um, so that's, you know, 2% return to theater, which is pretty low. Uh, the 0% failure, realistically, I quote my patients one in 200. Um, I'm well over 200 flaps now and haven't lost one. So my hope is that I'll be on the international stage, which is quoting one in 500, but I'm not there to quote that yet. Uh, I've done, um, <clears throat> PAP and tug, flap, tug flaps is, are my secondary option when patients either don't want to scar their abdomen or they don't have enough tissue or they've had previous surgery on the ab abdomen. Um, average operation time is between three and five hours and an average is about just over four hours and 10 minutes. 
uh, but we have had much shorter ones. They're generally sing single surgeon cases. So either myself or Nadim are doing them in tricky cases, we'll double up. And that's the beauty of being in a unit where there's two of us. Admit the same day, oftentimes we'll have a second patient on the list, which encourages us to hustle. Or if I'm doing it on the breast list, uh, they might do a, a short breast case like a wide local before putting on the mastectomy in the app. Average length say is 4.2 days, range from two days right up to eight. And there's no HD or ICU say. So they stay in recovery for two hours and then back to the world. But the idea of improving, actually, I didn't know what the sound so actually sure. <laughs> The idea of improving things, it's all about repetition over and over and over again. And the more we do of it, the more theater get good, the more recovery get good, the more that the wards get good. And to the point that uh, recovery nurse called me to see one of my flaps and showed it to me. And I was like, oh, I think it's fine. But actually she was right. She'd seen so many, it was getting slightly congested. So we brought it back to theater and fixed it. So the repetition of things just means everyone around you is getting really good at it. Uh, so that's the first you know, way that we develop our speed and efficiency. The second thing is, you know, I came back to a unit that had autologous reconstructions going and I was, I wouldn't say egged on, but I was definitely supported to take a few risks in terms of pushing things by both Nadim Ajmal and primarily Arnie. Um, you know, anytime I came to Arnie with a, a new plan to do something slightly different, he, he'd always say, let's go for it. Uh, so we've pushed on and on and on to the point that it's now a regular thing that we're doing something else on the list as well as a DEP. Um, and it, it culminated in us doing two DEPs in a day. And so back to back delayed reconstructions. Now we used two consultant surgeons, myself uh, and Nadim, uh, an anesthetist that we regularly use and a team that do regular DEPs with us. Um, and so we started the list at a normal time and we kind of hustled through it and we flew through it. And the end of the day with the microscope packed away and the room cleaned and mopped and everything, it's half three. So we've done two separate patients, two DEPs, and we're done at half three. If you don't believe me, there's a second clock. It, it's not fair to say we should be doing this the whole time. The trainees didn't get to do anything in these two cases, so I'm, I'm, I'm against it. Um, and it's not that I've come back and I'm a super quick surgeon. You know, I've kind of enabled, as being a second surgeon, I've, be, I've enabled the unit to progress. And actually, we both did our flaps in two and a half hours that day, uh, skin to skin, and Nadim's was about five minutes quicker than mine. So while Nadim was taking much longer before I came back, the safety of a second microsurgeon, a second set of expertise and eyes looking at stuff means that you can just push on and take more risks and get away with it. The second sort of thing that I'll talk to you, for me, Dieppe flaps are, yeah, obviously the best choice, but they're also a get out of jail. Um, so when things go wrong, and I feel very lucky as a plastic surgeon that I can take on implant-based reconstructions and know that I have a get out of jail. I'm just gonna take you through a case that's, uh, it's, I've recently just finished. So essentially a lady came in, uh, she had previous um, wide local excision on the left of the lateral aspect with DCIS positive margins. She had two goes of that and she's still a positive margin, so she came for a mastectomy. And she's a reconstructive nightmare because you can't really do anything there to match the right breast. So we talked about everything. And in the end, we talked about doing an implant-based reconstruction and I augmented the right. And this is bad. I was probably back in the country about a month and she had a pretty good result. I mean, it's a bit high on the left and things like that, but she unfortunately had positive margins. So she went off and had radiotherapy and because she's so thin, I don't know, but she seems like she got absolutely blasted. So she got a lot of radiotherapy damage to the skin and she got an awful lot of contracture to the point that she was in a lot of pain. So probably, you know, not thinking through things properly, I decided to switch, to, switch her to a pre-pectoral plane and put the pectoral muscle back down. I thought that was clever, but in actual fact, I did that and then I got infected and I lost everything. So now I have this young lady who is young and fit and healthy and she's 40 with a really badly radiotherapy chest and uh, an awful looking, you know, uh, cavity. And so the options, the classic option here is latissimus dorsi because she's very slim. I, I'm totally opposed to latissimus dorsi. I think it's harvesting a large muscle in the body that we don't have to. And here, my main concern was I needed to resurface as much of that skin was, as possible because it was all very thin and very hard and very fibrotic. So I did a bipedical diep on her. So that's taking two pedicles, connecting to the other. And the whole abdomen's weight was, I think, 250 grams. So it's this very small flap. So I knew I wasn't going to get the volume, but I... I knew I needed all the skin. And that's her, you know, six months after. And you can see she's still lacking a bit of volume, unfortunately, because I've augmented the other side. I've got to catch up here. 
So recently she came and you can see, uh, you know, I've ruined this lady's tummy, but we had a frank conversation about it and she was happier to have that than the LD scar and the, and the, the loss of that muscle. So I've since um, fixed the IMF, drawn this down a bit, and I've augmented this side to match that. And so she's got a really nice result now. And unfortunately, I can't show it to you because she didn't go into clinic yesterday. Implant reconstruction is the most commonly performed reconstructive technique. It's because it's faster, available for all patients. There's no donor site, faster recovery, and it's a much easier patient decision. But I think easier patient decision is overcome just with discussion. The ASBS American College, so DF flap back in 2012 was 6,500, 7,000, 7,000, 8,000, 8,500, 9,000, 9,500, 10,000. And an old UK paper essentially also showing the same thing that the DF is rising. And so we just have to look at how can we improve this? <clears throat> so we got to target these five areas. Faster surgery we're doing, you know, we're much quicker. We can go through, we can look at scans. You see here the two perforators coming out. Classically, you would find a perforator and follow it. But now with the scan, I can see that one is going around the muscle, one's going through the muscle. So that's like a 45 minute dissection. That's about a 15 minute dissection. Slim patients, you've seen, I can you know take tissue off anyone and make a breast out of it. And as long as it's only one side, you can pretty much get enough tissue for everything. Um, she hasn't had her nipple reconstruction and a little bit of loss of contour at the bottom corner, which is fixable. Bipedicles is you bring one vessel from one side, the other vessel from the other side, you connect them together. You can see tiny little connections here and then into the chest. It means, you get, it means you're able to take the whole abdomen. Refinements in terms of donor site mobility. So trying to do very small fascial incisions. So this is my two pedicles. The rectus muscle is not damaged. It's just been split. My fascial incision is really short. The other side, it's even shorter. And so it's really a skin and fat operation. And I tell patients, this is a complex skin operation. It's nothing more. That's the arc with line that we're staying above. So our chance of getting a hernia or a bulge is much lower because the two layers of the sheath, as you know, are intact above it. So you do tap blocks that I inject lateral to the semilunaris using blunt needles. I can usually feel the two pops as I get into the right layer to create a good analgesic effect. So the Dieppe flap, you know, is it the gold standard? It's the gold standard for us, but it's maybe not for the patient. It, we need to push immediate reconstructions. As you all know, you get a better result. Uh, and there's good evidence, there's really good evidence to suggest that in the majority of patients, it's, it's not harmful for the slight delay in the adjuvant treatment. Talked about ways to improve the depth. And the last thing that we just need to talk about as a group is breast and plastic surgery symbiosis. And, you know, it's always available, autologous reconstruction. The, the unfortunate thing in the Irish system, you just have to find a way. And I'll highlight Jerry uh, down in Waterford. You know, I get calls and texts off Jerry, patient wants autologous. Uh, Arnie very much is on board and we just make it happen. Maybe it adds an extra week or two to their treatment because we got to get them up and see them, but it's doable. And the more you do it, the more you push units like us to expand. You know, we're at the point that we need a third microsurgeon and that just makes us better in terms of being able to handle all these other referrals. It makes us quicker. It makes us get through more volume with lower complications. So next steps, I think, I think what I'd love to see is an integrated reconstruction MDT. So somewhere like uh, water, if I could, could plug in Jerry O'Donoghue, just put, put up pictures and we talk about why this patient is for autologous and needs to come up to see uh, myself and Nadim or one of the other units. Uh, we need to be doing multiple flaps on theater lists, but we need to can be careful that we don't, you know, uh, take over and not let the trainees do stuff because that's the risk when we look at speed. Uh, innervated Dieps is just starting to consider that. Um, there, there's vague evidence on it, but decent evidence. Uh, but not uh, not definitely confirmed that it's worthwhile. Then we need to start looking at our our, our, our lymph patients as well. Thanks very much. Okay, Th thank you very much, Jamie, for that uh, a super um, presentation. Uh, we're open to questions if we can. Um, we have a f number of minutes to discuss this, so maybe we could uh, get some questions. Do you want to take down your slides, Jamie? wish I knew. Yeah, one second. Great. Okay. So let's just go to the questions. Uh, if we have any in, if you want to, you can put up your hand and ask the question, take, turn your microphone off and ask if you wish. Maybe while we're, people are thinking about it, could I start off by asking, um, Jerry, you heard Louise talk very uh, coherently there about the challenges she had and why she ultimately felt it was just not possible to continue. 
Is it because you're working in different institutions that that pressure hasn't come on you? Uh, why, why do you think it's so different? You, you, you painted a very confident, uh, broad range of practice where Louise literally had no access to practicing general surgery and, and came against a lot of pressures. What are your thoughts, Jerry? Um, it's a really good question, and, and it's important not to start this off and sounding like I'm smoke or anything at all. I'm, I'm the opposite, actually. Her first slide was interesting in that she began a new job and didn't have a, a complete setup with regard to general surgery, access, theatre, outpatients, etc. Whereas I inherited two posts, uh, Joe O'Connor and Hugo Brins, and they had a setup when I came. And if you if you if you saw the first sort of two years of my practice, I did nearly 200, 250 OGDs and colonoscopies because that was set up and that's what I could do while everything else developed. So, but then that decreased as other things came along. I, so it depends on what you are, what cards you're dealt with. And it also depends on, on where you see and what you want to do. I love doing general surgery. I've always loved it. And um, it's something that I, I, I would do forever. So what you want to do and what you're dealt with. And as Louise said, her dream job was breast check. That would not be my dream job, to say the least. So I, I think it's what you have what you want and what you begin with might explain where I am, whereas what Louise didn't have and what she wanted might explain where she has ended up. And I think it's probably the same for those of us who want to stay on and those of us who don't. Martin, could I ask you, you or Louise, do you want to answer back or, and uh, not answer back as such, but comment on that? Is it a matter of where you actually take up your position? What might influence whether you're going to do general or not? It, it absolutely is, and it, it, it does depend on the contract that you get. Like the 2012 contract, which had no obligation on CUH to provide me with any resources. I was never getting anything by that point. The colorectal surgeons didn't have enough endoscopic access. You know, th the theatre complex in CUH didn't increase in size over the 10 years since I was there as a, a junior. You know resources are really what matters and if you inherit resources you can work from that when you have no resources you're working from scratch louise could i ask you do you think that you stayed too long on the rota and i asked that in the context of another colleague around the country who is let's say not as pleasant as you louise and uh, were a little bit more forceful did it in a different process in their hospital more or less shouting and screaming and saying no bad language i'm off the rota should you in hindsight have come off the rota earlier difficult question you were too nice always louise i i actually do believe i should have come off the rota earlier uh, because you know what you tolerate you validate so uh, my biggest concern was that that I would have a catastrophe and that would have finished me in surgery completely. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stayed at all. I would be gone. I'd be working in little. So the pressure that I put myself under to actually get through my elective workload and then to try and maintain skill. And I don't think I was bad at general surgery. I, I had a lot of very interesting cases. David Power, whenever we meet up, always goes on about a few very special cases that we had. A patient impaled on a tree, a guy who impaled himself on a, a broom through his liver. You know, we had exciting stuff. I wasn't bad at it, but I wasn't doing enough of it to feel comfortable. And in my elective practice, I'd often invite in colleagues if I felt that I was not getting as good cosmetic outcomes as I wanted. If there was something lacking in my elective practice, you know, that's what I do. And I felt that I didn't have the same opportunities in emergency surgery because you're actually in emergency surgery, it's what comes through the door. That's what you've got to deal with. And you can't predict what that's going to be. Um, certainly not scoping was a huge issue because, you know, with variable workforce, whoever's there with me, if I don't know what's wrong with the equipment and how to get it going, and they don't know what's wrong with the equipment and how to get it going, we have a patient who's deteriorating in front of us and neither of us have used this equipment since the last time, which could be three or four months ago. That's not sustainable. And yeah, I do think I probably, well, I certainly left it as long as I possibly could. There was no um, continuing by the okay. time that quick, came. 
A quick and difficult question for Jerry O'Donoghue. Jerry, you're a young man. Do you think you can keep going at this pace till 65 or are you going to burn out? What do you see as the future, Jerry? Like you're, you're going at full speed. You must tell us what drugs you're on. Uh, but what happens? Will you turn around at the age of 60 and say, oh, get me off the road? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, you probably know I, I do a lot of stuff outside this that keeps me sane. And, and for me, exercise is, is a huge component of my psychology. And, and when I'm injured, I'm not a good guy to be around. When I'm exercising, I am. And, and it keeps you physically fit as well. But don't get me wrong. By the time Friday comes around with all I've shown you there, I am tired. Whether I still physically and emotionally will be able to do it at 65, I don't know. And you and I know that at 60, getting up at 3 in the morning is totally different to getting up at at the age of 40 um, and yeah. it, it's 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 really hard to know but if i do stop at 60 or 55 or 58 so be it i've, I've done what i wanted to do and i've done it the way i've wanted to do it and, and i like working at 200 percent um but yeah don't get me wrong i'm home to put the kids to bed i know it's not like i'm justifying my work out here but but there is a work-life balance and if you get that right that makes a difference it makes okay a difference. We'll ask your wife on that work-life balance issue. And clearly the answer is an Iron Man a month keeps Jerry going. Quick question quick question for Martin O'Sullivan. Uh, Martin, you talked in your talk about the issue of uh, challenges to breast service. Sounds like family history needs a lot of resourcing. So should the government give money for family history and leave all the poor old men with hematuria out there unseen in no fancy clinics no rapid access service, just wait with your hematuria, but the low risk family history will have their mutation discovered and their MRI biopsy done on time. Martin, what's the answer if you're the politician? Oh, well, I'm not a politician, Arnie. As, as, as you know, I'm a bit more a straight talker and I'm rapidly turning into an old man myself, so I, <laughs> I need to be aware of my prostate and everything else. But I, I think you raise an important point. Uh, you, you know, I think we have finite resources and we really do need to put our money where you can get bang for our buck, so to speak. Certainly, I don't think, as I've mentioned, there's no argument with the high risk patients, uh, but the moderate risk patients are, are a significant problem. And if you look at the breast stats at the moment, um, you know, for the non-urgent patients, we're, we're, we've a less than 1% cancer detection rate. And that's, you know, that's not good value for money. I mean, a lot of our units were having problems, you know, getting CT scans on stage patients with no positive uh, disease. So, you know, we really need to put our money where the serious illness is. You know, listen, I'd love to have all the resources in the world for the breast services, but I do recognize there are other services out there also. But I do think what will happen in the family history uh, groups that have been set up is it will be an evidence based scenario. And I, I, I'm told there is money out there to try and, and fund a proper and a better service than what we have currently. And Martin, your global view from the capital of the country in Cork about Jamie's talk on DF to the way to go. Jamie's saying there is. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I, 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 I kind of agree, um, you, you know, I, 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 unfortunately our resources in Cork, and I'm not washing any dirty linen in the public here, you know, we don't have the same service that you guys have up, up in Beaumont. And I do think this is something that we need to develop. We need to get to the point, as Jamie's suggesting, you do things more and more frequently. It doesn't turn into such a big deal when you're doing a DF flap. Um, so, yeah, I think that needs to happen countrywide. Now, I do have a question for Jamie, and uh, he might not like it, but how many units should be doing DF flaps in the country? Jamie? You know, is it feasible to have all eight units doing it? Or, you know, there's even all six units currently that have plastic surgeons. Jamie, what are your thoughts? There's a challenging question. Of our eight units, only six of plastic surgeons, and certainly none of three microsurgeons, as you're about to appoint this summer. So what's the, what's the proposal for your, the national lead on this? What would be the advice? If you were the national lead designing things for the country, what would you design? Yeah, so ever since I was applying for SHO jobs and SBO jobs, plastic surgery always talked about the plans to expand into you know, the, the areas that need plastics, which are primarily Limerick and Waterford. You know, they have high volume orthopedic and there's breast services needs to be plastic there. But it's never happened and I don't think it ever will happen now with things becoming so centralized and also with things becoming super specialized. I think what we have now is um, 
good plastic services in every unit, but not excellent plastic services in every unit. And I think people like uh, Jerry Dan and Waterford have found a way around the fact that they don't have a plastics unit. And I think that's the only way you can do it. You just push your stuff into one center that will accept them. And most centers have someone like me that's, you know, like mad keen, like a dog with a bone, I'll take any bit of work that comes my way in an effort to increase volume. And this is something that you are only pushed on me and the deans push on me. The more volume we get, the more resources we can push for it, the more stuff, <clears throat> the more barriers we break down. And Martin, what I'd suggest is you have, you know, two plastic surgeons capable of doing the EPS. I would just absolutely inundate them with immediate EPS. And if, you know, uh, if you do that, then, you know, you're not at fault. You're just sending patients along for consideration. You know, Owen will have to fall in line do as many as he can. Jemima will then have to start doing And then the hospital will have to realize that you need to uh, start looking at appointing another microsurgeon. Once you appoint another microsurgeon, so Arnie will say, for the first two years of my job, I didn't have a theater space in Beaumont. But every free space going, I did at the Epping. Um, so there was no downtime. You know, anyone on leave, I took up their theater space. And, you know, if you, and that kind of proved the point of how much work to be done. And then I got theater space. So. So I'm kind of slightly the opposite in terms of how to get resources and things. I think you have to, you know, in the Irish system, it's not the right way, but I think you work like a dog. You prove your outputs and you prove the need for something. And then think, would you like to move down to Cork, Jamie? We've cheaper housing and cheaper schools. Okay, I think Sorry, it's time. I think it's time to close this webinar. <laughs> I tell you what, Jamie, we will allow you down to the Aviva next week to support Monster, but that's it. You may not transfer to Cork. Okay, guys, we're actually out of time. It's uh, twelve fifty. We're five minutes over schedule, and in case Jamie gets stolen to Cork, I'm just going to terminate this webinar. Are there any final burning questions uh, from our colleagues? If not, can I thank all the participants? I think they've been really superb talks. I've enjoyed them. Martin, a super talk on uh, breast service. Louise and Jerry, thank you for stepping up to the plate and uh, putting forward very honest appraisals of where you've been at and what's, what's happened. And I think the key message is it depends on the institution and the job you're in and your circumstances. And I think, you know, Louise, your reflections were very personal, but very appropriate for us all, all to listen. And Jamie, thank you for sharing with us the future of uh, DF Breast Reconstruction. I'm going to thank everyone. Thank you to all our, uh, and thank you for many, many people. We've had uh, over 40 people listening to us. Uh, thank you for joining the, this webinar. Uh, we look forward to doing it again at the next Charter Day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.